Love you. Don't be scared. It's gonna be fine. In the UK, some three million major operations are carried out every year. I'll be there with you all the time, okay? We'll look after you. But some patients' procedures are so complex, only the best surgeons can perform them. Everybody happy? Okie dokie. As soon as the patient is on the operating table, their life is in your hands. Adam Brooks and Royal Papworth Hospitals in Cambridge are world renowned for their pioneering techniques to treat conditions that few others dare to take on. It's a bonkers job, kind of like something from science fiction. But pushing the boundaries of modern medicine comes with great risk. I've got to get this right. Things can go wrong very, very quickly. We've got a venous bleed. You need to be able to accelerate from 10 to 100. Don't pull, don't pull. Jesus, what's happening? The surgeons bear the ultimate responsibility. We have a problem. There's a big problem. Can you just stop talking? When things don't go as well as they should, then you start to question, was it something you did? I have operated with tears rolling down my cheeks. Doing our job takes its toll, but being a surgeon shows you life is precious. That's it. You. Come on. Bravo. Woo! Ah, happy days. This is somebody's life, and it has to be done perfectly every single time. On the outskirts of Cambridge lie two world-renowned hospitals, Royal Papworth and Adam Brooks. One, two, three. Known for their innovative research and groundbreaking surgeries. OK, so is it going to start? Between them, they carry out 160 operations in their 42 theatres every day. Right, stitch, please. Some carry huge risk. It's not like one of those easy-peasy cardiac operations, you know? <laughs> Where decisions to operate are difficult, but could offer patients their best chance of survival. Adam Brooks is one of the nation's biggest centres for treating rare and complex cancers. It attracts highly experienced specialists, like consultant Ekpemi Irune who is one of the hospital's leading head and neck surgeons. Like, at a very young age, I knew I wanted to be a surgeon. You know, even as a child, all my dolls were all broken arms and legs. Rather than actually playing house with them, it was play hospital. She specializes in performing complex surgery to remove cancerous tumors. I was drawn to head and neck surgery. It's surgery on a big scale. It doesn't take much to make a difference. You know, if someone's got a lump, you take it out, and you don't have to wait too long to see the benefits of what you can do for a patient. I can't imagine being anything else but a surgeon. Ekpemi is taking on a particularly challenging case where a tumor is threatening her patient's life. 60-year-old Chris is a retired gardener and father and grandfather. About two months ago, uh, I was feeling just around my jawline and I felt it was like a, a little pea just underneath my ear. And I thought, oh, that doesn't sound right. Every day you could feel it hardening, going down my neck and uh, across my face and up my face. And in them two months, it's gone from a pea to what you see now. The tumour has grown so aggressively, Chris must have the operation as soon as possible. It'll just grow bigger and bigger and bigger. It's either you have the operation and you pull through, or you don't have the operation, and six months down the line, you're dead. So it's a no-brainer for me, really. He's always been sort of the strong one, you know, dad takes care of everything, so seeing him ill and vulnerable is, yeah, scary. Physically, he's not the same dad as before. He's still there, the humor's still there, it's still dad, but it's just 
on the outside, he, he's very different. You eat all your chips. Yeah. You eat all your chips. I don't think any of us really want to really consider what could happen. I think we're all trying to be as positive as possible, but it's always a nagging feeling in the back of your mind what might happen. Yeah. I hope that I feel it's successful if I wake up on the ward, to be honest. If I just get through the anaesthetic, uh, I've probably got a fighting chance then. So that's what I'm looking forward to, waking up. Chris's tumour is so large that removing it will leave a significant hole in his face and neck. The plan is to resect as much as possible, so take this, the skin and the tumour. Ekpemi will be joined by two plastic surgeons, Amir Durrani and Nick Segarin, who will take on the massive reconstruction. That tumour has increased in size, so that's another cause of concern from our point of view. Yes. This is among the most complex cases the surgeons perform. This is a scan of him. Around here, you can just see the tumour. As you go through the scan, it's involving the skin there, and you can see how it pushes out the ear lobe on that left side as well, and it goes all the way down into the neck. It's quite a large, large tumour. With surgery, we can hopefully achieve disease control. We can improve quality of life. This is why we come to work. This is why we come to work together. To take out the cancer, Ekpemi will first need to cut around the skin that's been affected. Then she will remove the tumor from the face and neck, carefully separating it from crucial structures like the carotid artery and internal jugular vein two of the major vessels that carry blood to and from the brain. Damage to either could cause a fatal bleed. It's a high-risk operation, and there's no guarantee that Ekpemi will be able to remove enough of the cancer to control it. That's a nice building, isn't that? But both the surgeons and Chris have agreed it's the right course of action. Chris's disease is so advanced that if we don't do anything about it, he will definitely die from his disease. I'm struggling. <laughs> so he's between the rock and a hard place. It's a very complex decision. Love you. I love you too. I'll see you. I'll see you on Sunday. Okay. You're all right, don't you worry about things? I love you. Just don't worry about things. Right. Love you very much. You're going to be fine. Yeah. You're going to be fine. Yeah. But even though he has advanced disease, he's young. He's only 60. Okay. Yeah. He's motivated. He still has a good quality of life. Uh, he has a big family. This one's me. Yeah. He was very keen to have something done. To add to the challenge, Scans have shown the tumour has started to invade the nerve which controls facial expression. Morning. OK. Thanks. Hi, morning. If it has to be removed, Chris will lose the ability to move the left side of his face. It's important that we do not compromise the ability to clear the tumour simply because we're trying to protect the nerve. Now, it's not easy to tell someone that we're going to take your tumour out, but we're going to leave you with a paralysed face on one side. If it is something that allows us to achieve disease control, then it's worth sacrificing it. Ekpemi needs to assess the extent of the damage to the nerve. How are you? I'm fine, yeah. So, you know, the plan today yeah. is to try and take um, all of this away from you. Yeah, it'd be lovely if you could. Yeah, I know, I know. And remember, we were talking about the nerve for the face, but I can't guarantee we can no, preserve no, no, it. No, that's fine. I'm just, just close your eyes again. OK. Tight, 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 tight. And relax, open them again. Raise your eyebrows. Good, and relax, OK. So your, your nerve is beginning to be affected. When you blink, if you blink quick, 
that blinks very quickly, but that's very slow. Oh, so the nerve is already beginning to yeah, be affected yeah. of um, no, being able I'd to rather, get... I'd rather you got rid of it all. Exactly, exactly, yeah. I can live with a droopy face. Yeah, that's it today, this morning, you know. Okay. I won't give you a stress yard anymore. We'll let you get ready and, and, um, and uh, take your time. Okay, okay. I'll get you down. Yeah. Good. Yeah. All good. Hey. Thank you. There was no doubt that that nerve was invaded. And, and so that option to preserve it got taken off the table. The facial paralysis caused by removing the now cancerous facial nerve will give plastic surgeons Nick and Army a more work to do to try to correct it. Hi, guys. Can we brief? Morning, everyone. Hello. So we've got one patient, a uh, gentleman, a 60-year-old man. So the plan is for him to have radical parotidectomy, radical neck dissection, temporal bone, partial temporal Going into surgery, it's about a couple of things. First of all, who are my partners? Who am I going into battle with? Pedicle flaps, grafts, slings. Saying the word battle, maybe that's a bit dramatic, but you know, sometimes it is when you're chasing disease like Chris's. Once Ekpemi has removed the tumour, Amir and Nick will reconstruct the hole left behind. When you're reconstructing someone's face, it's such a central part of their identity that I think there's added pressure because it's not something they can cover up with a piece of clothing. It's the first thing the patient looks at when they wake up and look in the mirror. Anything else? Okay, all good. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's have a go. Welcome to the theatres. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello, Mr. Christopher. Hello. Hello. If you could sit here and uh, lie down for me, please. I'm scared that I might not come out of the anaesthetic. Are you all right there, young man? Are you all right there? Okay. I think if I, if I come out of the anaesthetic, then I'll, I'll be all right. I'll be there with you all the time, okay? You're doing really well, young man. Your life is in their hands, and that's got to be done, so there's no point shying away from it. What time is it? Uh, Can I have a stool, please? The operation should take around six hours. Knife to skin. Starting yet? Starting. Thank you. Ekpemi begins by carefully cutting around the skin that's been affected by the cancer. That's, I feel, this feels really thick and awful. I kind of have some light here. I feel like I'm still in the dark. Thank you. Very good. Thanks. Everything's just bleeding. Can you rotate forward? Look at the lesion. It's bleeding itself. The huge tumour contains a sprawling network of tiny blood vessels. Swap, swap, swap. Every cut Ekpemi makes causes bleeding, making it almost impossible for her to see what she's doing. Even the tumour is bleeding. In cancer, new blood vessels growing, and therefore you put a cut somewhere and sometimes you get bleeding where you're not supposed to get bleeding. Another Raytek, please. When there's a lot of bleeding and you can't see, it's, it's a nightmare. Nothing is recognisable. Nothing at all. If she can't stem the bleeding, it's going to be difficult to ensure all the tumour is removed. It's a constant race against time. But in the same breath, you're also thinking, I may have to halt everything here because we may get to a point of no return. The blood bag. Next door to Adam Brooks is Royal Papworth, one of the world's leading heart and lung hospitals. Good afternoon, Royal Papworth Hospital. You through to the main reception. How can I help? Patients from all over the country come here for the most advanced cardiothoracic procedures. Okay. Yeah, looks good. Some of which are so complex, they stretch the skills of even the most experienced surgeons. Consultant cardiothoracic surgeon Ravi De Silva is one of their leading specialists. But 25 years ago, 
he considered a different career path. Well, before I wanted to do medicine, I really thought about being a long distance lorry driver. Morning. I like the idea of driving. Honestly, I, I love traveling. And then when that got kicked into the long grass, I, I really got attracted to medicine. From the moment I walked into a cardiac theater, I, I was hooked. Ravi is preparing for a challenging heart operation to replace a patient's aorta, the largest vessel carrying blood from the heart to the whole body. Should I bring her scans up? Yeah. A section of aorta has swollen dangerously and could tear at any time. The aorta should be about this size, which is the aorta is heading down towards the legs. In fact, it's this size, this whole big sausage here. It's certainly bigger than what it should be for the patient. The aorta has got bigger in quite a short period of time. The risk of it, uh, of it rupturing is very clear and obvious. If it isn't fixed, then the end result is death. 100%. His patient is 33-year-old receptionist Verity, who's come to Royal Papworth with her husband, Ashley. I love you too. Miss you. I miss you. She has a genetic condition called Turner syndrome, which affects one in 2,000 women. It can stunt growth and cause the thickening of the neck. My mum and my dad, they didn't know what it was. I was always a lot smaller than the other kids, and I used to get bullied quite a lot. In Verity's case, her aorta has also developed abnormally, making it so thin and fragile, it's ballooned dangerously. Ravi did it without open heart surgery and was needed. It's scary to put your trust in, in somebody like that, but I've, I've got to, you know, and I, and I do, I do trust him. Even though I'm nervous, I trust it. <laughs> I felt nervous when I woke up this morning, but actually just being here, I feel as if my body's going, you've got this. Verity's aorta, the largest artery which delivers blood to the whole body, is enlarged where it comes out of the heart. This means it is in danger of rupturing at any moment causing a fatal bleed. Ravi will need to remove and replace this section of aorta with a synthetic tube. At the base where the tube joins the heart is the aortic valve. Ravi is opting for the more difficult procedure today of trying to save Verity's own natural valve rather than replacing it with a mechanical one. I could replace Verity's valve and it would be an easier operation, but if we can allow her to keep her own aortic valve, it'll be better in terms of a human tissue is less likely to get infected. And also, if you have a mechanical valve, you need to be taking a blood thinning agent for the rest of your life. But Verity's short stature caused by Turner syndrome will make keeping the valve even harder. I've been a consultant now for 11 years, and in that time, I think I've operated on five people with Turner syndrome. The operation is difficult enough because it's technically complex, but you're doing it in a more confined space. It's a challenge which we owe Verity to undertake. Hello. Hey, Verity. It's good to see you again. Good to see you again. Have you been keeping well in yourself? Yes, very well. Ideally, what I want to do is to save your aortic valve. Okay. If there's any concerns, if I feel that we haven't done a good job, yeah. I'm going to take it out and I'll put a mechanical sure. valve in. Do you want to talk any more about the operation? I'm happy for you just to uh, do it. <laughs> okay. Verity's operation is taking place in Theatre 4 and is due to last five hours. All set? I think we've got everyone here. I could die whilst having surgery, but on the other hand, I could die without it as well. Hello, Verity. But I stand a better chance with the surgery. I'd rather take that risk. Becky's going to put some oxygen on your face. I'm going to have hunt for a vein. Helping Ravi manage this highly complex procedure is consultant anaesthetist Florian Falter. 
I'm ruthless in telling my trainees to be nice to patients when they put them to sleep. Even in the most healthy patient for the most simple operation, you might still be the last person they have seen in their life. And complications happen, and the complications we deal with are generally quite severe. God, Christ alive. So you've already got one drip in, but the second drip, which is the one in your artery that we spoke about, yeah. that's the one that's um, proving to be difficult. I'm so sorry, Jeff. No, don't be sorry. Even for such an experienced anaesthetist, Turner syndrome is making Florian's job far harder. Go and find one of my colleagues, please, Becky. Yeah, Verity's arteries are so small, it's proving difficult to insert an arterial line. That was, you made it look so easy. Can we make a start? Yeah. Ravi begins by cutting through the breastbone to access her heart and aorta. Hokely dokely. When I go into a theatre to do an operation, I have to have my game face on. If you don't have the confidence in yourself and your ability, you're going to be crushed by the weight of expectations and, and the responsibility that's on you. With the chest open, Ravi gets his first view of Verity's enlarged aorta. There she is. Uh -huh. That's a big sausage. A normal sized aorta is around 35 millimeters wide, but Verity's is nearly twice as big. When you first see a really enlarged aorta, you really get a sense that it's going to pop any moment and you're quite scared to go anywhere near it. But it's still a thing of awe. There's no question Verity's biggest artery needs replacing, but Turner syndrome means the organs and blood vessels around it are tightly packed together. Tiny, tiny arteries, minuscule. Yeah. Making this already risky surgery even more difficult. She is a challenge. Yeah. Next door in Addenbrooke's hospital. Play, please. They're three hours into removing the tumour from the face and neck of 60-year-old Chris. A section of cancerous bone around the ear has been drilled away. He's uh, something bleeding here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is it? But as Ekpemi continues to cut around the tumour, there's more bleeding. All right, suction to me, please. And it's slowing her down. Yeah, look at, look at, that's your bleeder. Artery clip, uh, like a clip, please. Operating on tumours like this, they bleed. They bleed all the time. So where is it? It can be frustrating when this happens, where you make a cut and there's a blood vessel, but the key is to keep going. Stop bleeding, that's it. It's better than it was. Yeah, that's fine. Let's crack on. Yeah. OK. God, can I give you, that? you know, we have so much to do. Eh? Just have to keep going. Ekpemi has reached where the tumour has grown into the facial nerve, right next to the ear canal. So this is the facial nerve? Yeah. It's already been compromised by the tumour, and for Ekpemi to clear as much of the cancer as possible, she must remove it. This is it. This That's is the branch. branch. Chris will be left without the ability to use the left side of his face, something the plastic surgery team will work to resolve later. Split it. OK, so... All right, so that's gone. Okay. Give me a harmonic there, please. Four hours in, and Ekpemi is ready to start the most dangerous stage of the operation. So we're beginning to do the neck now. Cutting the tumour away from the neck. It will be great to be able to take the tumour out, all of it at the same time rather than having to go layer by layer or cut bits and pieces out. What I would like to do is just come right onto the muscle and just lift. 
I think that'll be easier, and then come forward. As the tumour has grown, it's distorted the anatomy around it, making it difficult to locate two vital blood vessels, the carotid artery and internal jugular vein. Just because you've imaged the patient doesn't mean when you open the neck, it's going to look exactly like it did on the scans. In Chris's case, the tumour is growing. That would be, that'd be clavicular head, if anything. Yeah. It means that nothing is where it's supposed to be. It makes your operation more challenging. No fucking normal anatomy. It'd be nice to just meet some goddamn normal anatomy. That's not yeah, going to happen. See something just, you know, exactly. Ekpemi can't continue to cut out the tumour until she's found these blood vessels. Let's just see if we can find out these major vessels. They carry almost half a pint of blood a minute from the heart to the brain. An accidental nick could cause catastrophic bleeding. I'm just looking for the jitesh. I'm looking for his carotid. So carotid is still very far forward here, isn't it? One Might second, be the sponge. Can you feel the carotid? That's carotid. Beaut. Yeah. Ah, happy days. Now we can just get on with this. If I am right on the carotid and taking tumour off the carotid artery, that always gives me a bit of a flush up the back of my neck. Yeah, yeah so true. suction. Right, well, Jesus, what's suction. happening? Suction. Suddenly, there's a major bleed. Oh, yeah, what is bleeding? Can yeah, we stop I this? Yeah. The baby's to me. It's not gonna stick. We've got to put it. Yeah, we have to lift okay. it. Nice and quick. I think it's IJV that's bleeding. It's Chris's internal jugular vein, the largest in the neck. Okay, it's got a hole in it. Yeah. It's not protected by bone or cartilage, so it's extremely susceptible to damage. Give me a round, buddy. Yeah. If you don't respect those big vessels, because you have an uncontrollable bleed and you've got tumour in the way, therefore you can't get to the vessels to control them, of course you could kill your patient. Some tumour, yeah. Oh, you get it? Like non-stop with this. That's it. OK, that's my IJV. Good, 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 good. So just... Uh, just stop that bleeding for a second, isn't it? That's IJV, isn't mm -hmm. it? Perfect. Good. Yeah. We've got it now, I think. I think we have. OK. We're back. Swabbing in. All right. So swap. When no, we're just going to lift that up now. Okay. Thank you. With the bleed controlled, Akpemi is ready to remove the tumour in one piece. OK, so that's good. We're doing Thank well. You. I think it's almost out. Finally, you get to a place where you go, we're making progress here. We're not out of the woods yet. And you're never cocky about it because remember, this is just one of several steps we have to get through. This is taking so much longer than I wanted. <laughs> well, at least we've cleared the disease. And, you know, we can say we actually have cleared the freaking yeah. disease. Let's just go for it. Four, five, one wet. All right, OK. Actually, I never thought yeah. we'd get it on block, right? Yeah, very nice. All good. When the tumour comes out all in one, it's extremely satisfying and rewarding. You know, we have clearance. Good, 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 good. It's always a, a great feeling when you start something and at the end you go, couldn't have done any more. Even if you gave me another 10 hours, couldn't have done any more. All right, good. Ekpemi may have successfully removed the tumour, but this is only half the battle. Right, let's um, transfix. Now plastic surgeons must reconstruct Chris's head and neck and attempt to correct the droop caused by the loss of the facial nerve. Even though I'm pleased that this has gone the way that I want it. Let's have a thrill vicro to transfix, please. The journey's not over.
your mind tends to be racing with all the possibilities of what might have happened or might be happening. It's just hoping that you've said everything that you want to say to Dad, that, that he knows how much we love him, how much everybody cares. You just want to make sure that you've said everything you need to and you want to. So if we can clamp around here, yeah. we'll take as much of this away as possible. Yep. Next door in Royal Papworth, Ravi is about to replace Verity's damaged aorta. Good with bypass, all good. Before he can operate, he needs to stop Verity's heart and put her on the heart and lung bypass machine, which will take over the job of circulating and oxygenating her blood. 32, did you say? 32, please, yeah. Ravi will first clamp off the blood supply to the aorta. Then he can disconnect the coronary arteries and cut away the damaged section, but leave the aortic valve in place. The synthetic tube is slipped over the valve and sewn directly into the heart. Then the valve is sewn to the inside of the tube. Finally, he will reconnect the coronary arteries to deliver blood to the heart muscle and attach the other end to the aorta. Yeah, just there. Only when he restarts Verity's heart will he know if the valve, which controls blood flow from the heart, is still working. All right, let's check this valve out. Be really careful, yeah, because normally we're not used to having to worry about the valve. We just chop it and suckers go everywhere, but in this one we've got to be really careful. Because Verity's young, it's worth trying to save her valve. She's got many more years ahead of her, and if we can allow her to keep her own aortic valve rather than having a man-made valve, it's better for the reason that a human tissue in general is more durable and less likely to get infected. It's certainly worth trying. Ravi must cut out the diseased section of aorta without damaging the tissue around the valve. Concern here. Look. We thought about how much tissue there'd be, right? There's not much. I think there's not much. Then he'll stitch in the new synthetic aorta. There's not really much space for this, is there? But Verity's small size is making it challenging. Certainly the anatomy is not helping us. No. We know that Turner's patients generally are a bit more petite, and that means the operating field is smaller and deeper, so in fact, access is more difficult. The replacement aorta needs to fit perfectly around the valve he's trying to save. 28. Ravi must choose a synthetic tube or graft that is wide enough, but not too wide, to fit around it. Let's go with a 28, 28 valve the size of the graft that I use to replace the aorta, that can't be stretched. That's a certain fixed diameter. It's not like human tissue, which you can pull and push a little bit and make it fit and conform. So the space that I have to fit all of Verity's valve into is tight. This is where you need to really make sure the inside, mm -hmm. the tissue is all on the inside, yeah? Ravi places the graft made from surgical grade cloth around the valve at the exit of the heart. Can you lift up on that again? He now needs to attach the graft to the valve with the utmost care and precision. We've got to get this right, because it's a whole world of pain otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. The needle's a sharp thing, and the last thing I want to do is, in these tight areas, to inadvertently damage her valve with the back of a needle. So the tightness of the space adds that extra challenge. Peter, with these stitches, you've got to keep the tension all the way around. To secure the graft and reduce the risk of leaking, Ravi must place over a hundred stitches a millimeter apart inside the bottom of the synthetic tube. If any of those stitches 
are loose or spread out wrongly, you're going to get bleeding. Okay, cut please. The good news or the bad news? Good news. We're halfway around. Bad news, he's got another half to go. <laughs> I used to practice on lots of things. Uh, I'd take a rubber glove home, cut the fingers off and stitch the fingers back on. And that, you might think that's a really strange thing to do, but a lot of cardiac surgery is about stitching circles to circles. So the texture of a rubber glove can be reasonably similar to what you experience in theatre. Okay, everyone relax now. Ravi puts the last stitch into the valve. Well, look, it's pretty good, huh? Then plums back in the coronary arteries, which supply oxygen-rich blood to the heart muscle. around the suture line as well. Mm -hmm. It's okay. All right, should we give it a go? They must now test the join. If the valve is incorrectly positioned, blood will flow the wrong way through it, leading to heart failure. Green's off, is it? Green is off. It doesn't feel like it's filling up. That's getting cold. It's cold, huh? cold yeah. 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 Yes, certainly do. Stop the plea, Jeff. Got it, please, off. Okay, we need a repair stitch. Yeah. So what we're going to need. There's a tiny leak. I think I know where it is. Coming from where one of the coronary arteries has been joined to the graft. It's kind of weighty. It's down there, wasn't it? Yeah. That stitch might go at the bottom there, so I think I might just have missed something. Right at the bottom. I think it's in here. Unless Ravi can make the join watertight, he won't be able to reconnect the aorta or restart Verity's heart. The tools Ravi uses, from forceps to surgical scissors, might seem like simple pieces of equipment. All right, let's have uh, scissors. But precision is so important that the smallest fault in just one of the 100 tools used in Verity's operation can be detrimental. At Adambrook's, clinical engineer Graham Morrow services thousands of surgical instruments every month. Morning, Aishas. Good morning. Faulty tools are sent to the mechanic's workshop, where it's Graham's job to repair or replace them. you get wear in the in the joint or jaws misaligned. If you forget a pair of scissors that aren't sharp, it, it will tear the tissue rather than cut it. Graham has an encyclopedic knowledge of over 4,000 types of surgical tools, including over 100 different types of scissors and forceps. You get a feel for what instruments should actually be like. So the way it helps you when you actually come to repair something, when you've handled a new instrument, you know exactly what the surgeon wants in his hand and how it should feel to him. And it's important that he has the right instruments to do the job. It requires great attention to detail. Even the simplest pair of scissors takes over an hour to sharpen and then test to ensure they're in impeccable order. So every pair of scissors that we have, we will check to make sure that the, uh, they pass the drop test, which is basically hold the scissors at 90 degrees and then let go and they shouldn't close fully up. There should be about two thirds of the blade left open and then, uh, and then they should cut through to the tip then. Any faulty instrument could be a, a danger to a, to a patient. It's got to be sharp, it's got to be sharp. I've always been into engineering from a very early age. I left school and I got myself an apprenticeship at making parts for missiles and uh, sort of gone full circle now. Perfect. Making things that injured people to uh, looking after equipment that helps people get better. Our first child, unfortunately she was born three months premature. Um, so she spent the first two months of her life here where she received some amazing treatment. She made it through, we got her home. For that, I'm internally grateful. This is a way of putting something back into the NHS. 
It's still quite emotional, actually, even after 25 years. They've given us life, so, uh, yeah. And when you're up there, you realise how precious life is. Surgery is coming to an end in most of Addenbrooke's 35 theatres. Do you want to transfix that? Yes, yeah, please. Yeah. But in Theatre 20, the operation to remove Chris's tumour is heading into its seventh hour. We need to prep the chest again. It's ready to All right, let's get a wash, please. Ekpemi has managed to cut out the tumour in one piece. Everything else has come out nice and got clearance. But having to remove so much cancerous tissue has created a large hole in Chris's face and neck, and now the left side droops. I'm taking away bad tissue, and I'm lucky to have great plastic surgeons who can come and put healthy tissue back in the place. How are you doing, all right? Do it's gone well, one? very happy. Plastic surgeons Armia and Nick must reconstruct the area. Thanks, everyone. I'm just round the corner. A procedure so extensive, it's at the very limits of what's possible. I think this reconstruction is one of the biggest that I've ever had to undertake. I can have some fresh small drapes, please. The big challenges in Chris's reconstruction is to address the problems that taking the facial nerve will impact on him. And that's everything from being able to close your eye, to blink, to eat food and to drink water. To correct the droop caused by the loss of the facial nerve, the surgeons will perform what's called a static facial reconstruction. They will take tissue from Chris's thigh, cut it into strips, and attach them between his cheekbone and three points on his face. These form a trio of slings which will lift the muscles on the left side of his face. Next, muscle harvested from the chest will be manoeuvred through a cavity created under the skin to fill the neck and part of the face. A second section of muscle taken from the temple will fill the rest of the gap. Finally, skin will be taken from his leg to cover the entire site. What are you today? Uh, I was going to do monopole fasci yeah. 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 Nick will create the sling that will hold Chris's face up now his nerve has been removed. He's had a massive operation. After a facial nerve resection, the patient looks like they've had a stroke. It's fairly obvious there's drooping at the corner of the mouth, so it's important for him that the sling works. All right, do you want to start on that? Yeah. They carefully remove strips of muscle, called fascia lata, from Chris's thigh. Right, can I have a bit of wash, please? Chris won't lose movement with the loss of this muscle, and it's perfectly suited to be used as a sling because it's strong and doesn't stretch. The little things in life matter, I think. Being able to keep a drink down, being able to walk to the shops and people not to stare at you. Midfield? Yeah, absolutely. He attaches one end of each strip to Chris's chin, upper lip and cheek. You can very gently pull it up and hitch it up to here, yeah? Yeah. It'll be okay. Yep. Yeah. And the other ends to his temple to create the sling. So the sling acts to hoist everything up into a position that leads to some degree of facial symmetry. Have you got a pen there, please, Benjamin? Yeah. Charles, put your finger on that. While Nick continues to work on the sling, Armia concentrates on reconstructing the hole left in Chris's face and neck. Plastic surgery is a combination of science in terms of the anatomy and art, uh, and it's marrying those two together that delivers an excellent reconstruction. First, Armia must free a 30 centimetre long flap from Chris's pectoralis muscle in his chest. Then he creates a tunnel under the skin and pushes this flap up to the neck. Keeping it connected to its existing blood supply so it can survive in its new position. Can we get, can we move his arm out? Yeah, perfect, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we give me this. Yeah. This muscle will provide important protection 
to the now exposed carotid artery and other nerves and blood vessels in Chris's neck. I need to do some releasing now to get it up as high as possible. Excuse me. But they're struggling to feed up enough muscle to cover the size of the hole. We're just trying to get as much length as possible on the muscle. The challenge is to make sure that it covers the whole of the neck because the tumour yeah. had progressed since he was seen in clinic just a couple of weeks before. Big swap, please. You feel it giving? Okay, come up under there with the retractor, the retractors. Okay. That will come to there, that will come to there, and that will take a graft. Perfect. Okay, don't think we can get any more length on that at all, but I think it just does what it has to do, which is cover the great vessels and, and gives a nice layer there, yeah. Okay, give me a stitch, please. Armia fills the remaining gap with another flap from Chris's temple and stitches them both into place before Nick covers the whole area with skin grafted from the thigh. It's a feeling of relief. Um, the operation has gone successfully. Thank you. But then we have to hope that the skin grafts take, that the wounds heal together, that my slings are in a good position. That's all the next phase over the next few weeks. Oh, this looks really nice. Uh, don't you not think? I think you've oh, done well. a good job. Just want him to wake up all healthy. Yeah. That's it now, because I think everything else has gone well, you know? Absolutely. Having been anaesthetised for over 12 hours, Egpemi wants to check how Chris has responded to the operation. How do you feel? Are you okay? Have you got any pain? It's all gone well. I'm going to call your wife, okay? I feel that as a team, we've done well. We've done right by the patient. We've done right by his family. All right, guys. All right. You did really well, okay? Everything went well. Hello. Everything's gone well. Um, we've resected the tumor properly, and uh, we're happy with the resection. But we still have a long way to go. We've got to get him healthy and out of the hospital. He's not out of the woods yet, but um, this, this first step has been worth it, and it, it's good so far. Okay. All good. Bye, guys. Thank you. Chris will now be kept under close observation as he begins his recovery. Are you okay, dear? Yeah, that's good. In Royal Papworth, Ravi's operation to replace Verity's enlarged aorta is overrunning. Because there's not much space, right? He's been able to save her valve, but there's a leak where the coronary artery is stitched into the synthetic aorta. That's where you put that extra reinforcement stitch as well. Hangs below that. It's only the tiniest leak, but the join needs to be perfect. Because when Verity is taken off bypass, and blood flows into the coronary artery, it could cause a fatal rupture. I think it's in here. The bleeding is at considerable pressure. It's the pressure of your blood up to 120, 130 millimeters of mercury, so considerable force at which the blood is jetting out of the coronary artery. That has to be fixed. It can't be left. It's not something which is going to magically sort itself out. But you can't be overly aggressive in how you put that stitch. It's got to be placed just right. Take one more shot. Yeah. Should get it, yeah? It's quite deep. Yeah. Ravi must place extra stitches around the leak before testing the join by pushing blood through the aorta. If you're not confident, that sense of fear or of uncertainty, that spreads through the team like wildfire. It, it's a mindset that you have to be in if you're going to take control of a situation and try and get the patient through an operation. 
Nick, we're going to go again with the pleasure. Yeah? Okie dokie. Thanks, go for it. Thank you, kind of pleasure on the running. That's better, yeah? yeah. That's going to have to be it, guys. It's quite close to the wind. It is very close, but that's what we've got Follow. to deal with. Yes, please. Thank yeah, you. With the coronary artery joint fixed, Ravi can sew the other end of the tube to the remaining aorta. And he's ready to carefully remove the clamp and let blood flow through Verity's heart and into the new synthetic tube. And the green is off, Nick, is that correct? Green is off. Good. You hope that the heart is ready and uh, able to take on the strains. What you don't want is for the the blood pressure to suddenly shoot in the wrong direction and cause everything to start bleeding like a watering can. Good. Finger on the hole next. Square on the hole. Coming off bypass is always a tense moment. It's always the moment of truth where you learn whether the result is the one you want, whether all the sutures are in the right place or whether it's bleeding. Two inch, it's left, comes off. Very trivial now. Excellent. Verity's heart appears to be beating well, but there's one final test. Using an echocardiogram, Ravi wants to check he's positioned the valve properly inside the synthetic tube, and the blood isn't leaking back into the heart. It's an uncomfortable moment. You can feel the anxiety in the room, and everybody sort of stares at the screen. Aortic valve is pretty competent. There's one little jet which is negligible. Yeah. And heart looks happy as well. Heart looks happy. ECG yeah. is nice. ECG looks happy. No air. When I hear from Florian that it all looks great, that's uh, an immense relief. That's a sense of satisfaction and a little bit of, yeah, a little bit of euphoria. So are you happy? One, two, three. Is that Ashley? Yes, it is. She's she's fine. We've done the operation and everything so far has gone to plan. OK. Um, I've, as you probably know, I was trying to keep her own aortic valve and um, yep. we've managed to do that. The result looks really, really good. And, you know, to be honest, it's as good as I could have hoped for. Thank you very much for everything you've done. Pleasure, Ashley. Yes, bye bye. Yes, bye. bye. Verity was discharged from Royal Papworth 16 days after her operation. Today, she's back to see Ravi. Hello, how there? Thank you, nice to see you. Since you've left us, how yeah. have you been? I did have some palpitations, yeah. um, but yeah. they've gone down, you know, they're not as much now. So that sensation of palpitations, that's very, very common. Yeah. I want to show you your x-ray from today. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is excellent. Right. OK. You've got your right lung is here, your left lung is there, and, and this blob here, that's your heart. Now, all of that looks fantastic. I do my chest exercise as well, yeah. and my breathing still, and good. but I've lost a stone as well. I've been really good with my diet. Well, well done. Uh, and you look like you're pretty much back to normal. Yeah. As surgeons, I think we're always striving for what we think is the best for our patients. Sometimes the right thing is the easy option, other times the right thing is the difficult option. You've just got to go with whatever it is, but try and do the best thing for your patient. The best thing is seeing you come back to clinic today yeah. looking so well. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. All right? Yeah. Yeah, really good. Yeah, really well. So he was really happy. Yeah. And he, you know, he's still going to see me again, but it's nothing to worry about. It's just, okay. you know, to keep Routine monitor checks. and, yeah, just monitor me, and which is nice, you know. I'm looking forward to just not that worry being lifted. I think today's the start of that. Thinking, right, okay, yeah, I don't have to worry anymore. Bye, Papworth. <laughs>
It's been four weeks since 60-year-old Chris had major surgery to remove a tumor from his face and neck. Now he's returning to Addenbrooke's, so his surgeon at Pemi can assess him and discuss the next steps in his treatment. Hello there. Hello, come on in. How are you? Just come in. Come and have a seat. While Akpemi was able to take out the tumour, Chris will still need a course of radiation therapy. When we say the operation was successful, it means that we took the disease as far as we could. It has always been a challenging prognosis because even be disease as advanced as this, as um, aggressive as this, you worry that you know, the disease is already growing back by the time you're waking the patient up from the anesthesia. That's how aggressive disease like this can be. All we can do now is take it one step at a time and hope he has the outcome he wants. It's hard to fit everything that you love about somebody into a sentence. Dad was so brave and so strong. He didn't complain about his lot. He just pushed through. You're never ready to say goodbye to somebody and we're all extremely grateful to the surgeons for everything they, they did. There are many times when we don't win against cancer and um, it, it is always um, humbling. It's important that we were able to do what he asked us to do, which is to try and try again, because he wasn't ready to throw in the towel yet. He wasn't ready to give up. We were able to buy him some extra time and he was able to spend that time with his family at home. And that's important, that's an important part of what we do. Being a surgeon teaches you that life is precious and shows you that life is short. And that's something that we don't take for granted. Next time. It's a long way down. Surgeons operate in the most hard to reach places. It's like the dark side of the moon. Where there's no margin for error. Just as you're getting tired, the stakes are getting higher. It's easy for things to go badly very quickly. Life is too short. Tomorrow is not a promise.